Welcome to part 5 of our Cornucopia ML Quick Start Training. This is the fifth of eight videos for this course. Please visit our website at bodytech.com for additional details on downloading the accompanying PDF course notes and other training files. In this section of the course, we will concentrate on importing and exporting data files with Cornucopia functions, and then plotting the data using a variety of techniques and options. This will prepare us to tackle realistic problems and workflows that will be demonstrated in the workshops for this training class. First up is importing data files using Cornucopia functions. So I already showed how to use the MATLAB import wizard to import data. You can also, if you have a, a variable and you've saved it in the workspace with MATLAB save function, you can load it back in to another session of MATLAB with the load function. That will work for regular variables of MATLAB as well as Cornucopia variables, provided that you're a Cornucopia user. So if we're trying to import data from a file, Cornucopia has these functions to import data from text files. So this is to read tabular-like data. This is to read generic text files that you're not really trying to parse, you're just trying to get it in so then you could do some other kind of manipulation. A great example of this is if you're trying to import finite element input decks to do some manipulation. Uh, in some programmatic way, you can read in a whole input deck this way. And the unpack header I showed was to unpack certain parts of header text that are in files commonly. Then we have specific functions to import from Abacus and SD Impacts. And then the K write text will write out text files from Cornucopia variables in a smart, orderly way. Or you can convert variables to a structure or a table to share natively with other MATLAB users that don't have Cornucopia. The power of Cornucopia's reading text function format, it'll work with a really, really large array of ASCII files. So Cornucopia generally doesn't go down the approach of having a special function for every kind of special file there is. Instead, it has a generic smart parsing technology that will read all these kinds of text files, including files that have data sets stacked one on top of the other. Maybe they have uh, information that delineates the things. Maybe they don't, they just stack one on top of the other. The units might be next to the column names, the units might be under them, a variety of variations like that. All these kinds of files can easily be read and processed with these two functions. And then if you have files like this, which is an example of an Abacus input doc, this could also be an LS Diner or ANSYS uh, input file. You can read those in with this kread text to cell string function or any other and this will read, the bottom one will read any text file in, including even MATLAB M file scripts. And then it'll bring it in as a cell string, which then you can further manipulate as you desire inside of MATLAB. Cornucopia has some special functions to help you manipulate that. And then you can, of course, use native MATLAB functions. The uh, workhorse by far, though, would be the read text function. It's designed to read everything from single data sets that maybe have no column names or anything to files that have multiple data sets and are rich with information. It's based on the concept that if it's a simple data file, you can literally give it the file name and the delimiter, and Cornucopia will read in just pure numeric things like that. Or if you have more complicated files with a lot of context like column names and other things, you give it the file name and the delimiter, and then you give it three sets of additional things that are helping it find where does the start of the data set begin, where does the column headers begin, and where does the end of the data set. Uh, and the help page talks about this and gives you lots of good examples. I'm going to demonstrate a couple right now and then point to a couple other um, things. So we have a CSV file called transient force. Uh, that's given to you in your data files for the uh, course here. Now, since that's a CSV file, if I want to look at it in its native form in a MATLAB, I don't click open because that'll open it up in the wizard. I would click open as text as I'm right clicking on it. And with open as text, it will open up this, show it in the editor like a text file, showing it in its true native form. And here I can see I have some header text at the top. This header text is pretty uh, hellacious. It's got like some things that look kind of like names, 
Sometimes the units are on the left. Sometimes the units are on the right. Sometimes there's no unit. Sometimes the unit's associated with a multiplication sign, square bracket, smooth bracket, like a random mess. So we're going to show that unpack header function of cornucopia is smart enough to unpack that smartly. And then we'll read the rest of the tabular data as well. So first we open it up in the MATLAB editor as text to see what there is, so then we can write the command appropriately. Then we would issue our kread text thing, get the help popped up to get our template. Once we have the template, we're going to paste that in, and then we're going to make some modifications to our template. So in this particular case, given that data file, we're referencing the data directory, our file name, the delimiter. So this is fairly similar to what we did before. This time for the start string, we're specifying spec load. So what we're doing is this is the very beginning of the header text that we want to keep. So we're specifying this word for it to find on this row. And that is the marker it finds. When it finds that, we don't want to shift any further. So we're setting that to zero because at this thing is where the header actually starts. And then we're going to search for disp or something like that, which doesn't show any else here, to get where the column starts and no shifting. And there's nothing at the end of the file to look for. We use those, issue the command, it reads it in, and in the user data, it has the nice set of information that we want to get at. And then continuing the example, so this was our header data. This was it read in. Now we're going to isolate that header text, which is this, which is this. And we're going to unpack it and turn that into that. The importance and the beauty of this is if you have a folder with 10 files, you can easily loop this and it will smartly do all this. You're not manually edily doing this with edits by hand, which are known to be error prone and make your process a lot more elongated. Now, reading and writing text files is kind of like the Wild West. There can be all kinds of flavors of text files. I'm just demonstrating a couple here. The function is designed to read all kinds. Not every kind, but many. And so there are two tutorials. They're pretty significant in length. But if you look at them and read them, you will see like the one on reading goes over 12 vastly different kinds of text files, showing you how to import them successfully. And then writing shows how to write out different eight different scenarios, including writing out and modifying FEA input docs. So these tutorials teach you a lot about how to do that. So you can also, of course, check the help system. Uh, in particular, on the K read text, it's got some advanced options. One of them that you might need to use is this unit string map. That ADV option handles cases where the strings of units that are put in somebody's files are not correct. So an example of that would be if in this file, um, let's say the millimeters here was written as capital M, capital M. Cornucopia doesn't have a unit like that. And units are case sensitive. So Cornucopia, this would give an error when it tried to um, convert the unpack header of that. But you can use this advanced option to say capital M, capital M is really equal to little m, little m. Or if somebody puts LBF as capital LBF or some other name of a unit that Cornucopia doesn't recognize, this advanced option, which you can find in the help system, will show you how to get around that problem. All right, the next thing I want to uh, show is for Abacus users, how you can import data from an Abacus ODB. So uh, I will demonstrate this live. Um, now, some of the people on the call are not Abacus users, so like you won't be able to do this, of course, because you need Abacus. But for those who are Abacus users, I think you'll find this a lot more enticing way to import data from Abacus as opposed to the traditional approach that you would currently do. So I'm just going to go here. And I'm going to say stuff, just some variable. OK, underscore, I'm interested in Abacus stuff, so I'm going to the ABQ choices. So there's a variety of ones. The one you would generally use is this import ODB import GUI. Some of these other uh, functions here are from initial implementation many years ago. 
but this is like an all-in-one function that's very powerful. It has potentially options you can use, or you can just run it with no options, which is what I'm going to demonstrate. So running it with no options, it will open up this interactive little pop-up that is going to walk me through four things of me picking the file, specifying the units, selecting the entities I want to import, and any steps from the Abacus ODB. I have choices on this control that I'm currently setting everything to be browse. I could pick certain things, so like use the previous version of whatever I last use this, or other choices. So right now I'm just going to do everything in browsing mode. And this button here allows me to have it copy all the internal commands needed once I do this, so that next time I can just paste the commands in. So we'll demonstrate that in this little demonstration. So I'm picking next, and it's going to browse. So I'm going to go browse to where my data is. So for this example of the tutorial, um, we gave you, so I put in a training folder here. So I gave you in this tutorial, I gave you an example ODB. So again, you have to be an Abacus user for this to work because it uses a component of Abacus to read this. But if you're an Abacus user and you have Abacus on your computer, you'll be able to open this up and read it. So I've picked the file. You have to know what the units of your data are. Um, Abacus doesn't store that anywhere in the ODB, so you have to know that from the model you made. And now it's going to go take the ODB, and it's going to read it in for me. So what it's doing right now on my computer is it's firing up the Abacus engine to read that, and it has imported the ODB. Now, depending on the version of Abacus you have, the ODB might need to be converted, and you might see a comment about it converting an older version of the ODB to the newest version of Abacus you're having. There's no problem with that. I'm just notifying you if you see that. So this list is exactly the same list you would see if you were an Abacus viewer, which is the post-processor of Abacus, looking at the history data, not field data, history data. So the user, when they made the model, requested these variables to be outputted history data. So I'm just going to demonstrate picking a couple of them. So I'll pick a couple of strains. I'll pick some acceleration data. And I'll pick a displacement. Uh, and we have an energy. Yeah, we've got a couple of energies. So we'll pick those as outputs. This model happened to have only one step. If there was multiple steps, you could pick from them. And so now Cornucopia is using uh, Abacus Viewer in a headless way to read the data set. Oh, and one of the things I picked has a data set that uh, doesn't have the same length. So um, let me go redo that again quickly. That's what happens when you go off script. Um, one of the variables that I output had a, uh, had a different time sequence that I asked for the output. So I will avoid that. OK, so we'll do this more correctly. So I'm going to pick acceleration and displacement. And we'll pick a couple of strains. And now it should bring it back in a single flat variable, yes. So it's also giving me the commands. So the variable, since I put no semicolon, echo to the command window. We'll look at that in a second. I'll paste the commands. And what it's giving me here is a little description of what the commands are. These were the selections that I made. This was the step I made. And this is calling the function with explicit commands. So this would then allow you to then use this in like some for loop to um, read a whole bunch of ODBs, maybe just changing the file name, but getting the same thing out of every ODB. Now, if you look at the output here, Cornucopia did several nice things for you. It automatically labeled the columns. It put units on. The strain is dimensionless. That's why there's no unit showing. The acceleration would be in millimeters per second squared. And if I wanted to um, change that to uh, other units, I could do a command like this. So let me just put this up here and show you uh, kind of manipulating this a little bit. So if I wanted to change the units, I could say stuff equals stuff dot convert. 
and I'm hitting dot tab to get that. So I could say, I want the time in milliseconds and I want the strain in percent. And then I want the acceleration in Gs and we'll keep the uh, displacement in millimeters. And now it is presenting the data for me in that. This is really only needed for presentation purposes because again, cornucopia would calculate perfectly fine with the units like this or this, it doesn't matter. Now, if you're an Abacus user and you're first trying to do this, you might find the functionality works fine or you might find the functionality doesn't appear to work. That's because the way Abacus's commands might be called on your local computer are different than Cornucopia's default assumptions. So there's a function in Cornucopia K set that sets global parameters in Cornucopia. And it has an option of Abacus no GUI command. And so you would go look at that to figure out how to modify that setting for your particular environment. The key point though, when you use this compared to the normal approach of getting data out of Abacus is your variable will come back fully populated with not only column names and uh, units, but even the column comment section will be populated and it will be populated with all the details that was in the original database telling you what element did it come from or what node, and what part and what it is. All of that information is stored with the variable that you can then later access. For those who are using SD impacts uh, for data um, measurements, um, Cornucopia has tools to easily allow you to process a ton of that data. There's a couple of nice videos on the website. They were referenced at the beginning of the training. Um, I'll just give a quick highlight here. So when you use this experimental data acquisition system to collect data for every measurement event, it'll generate for every single uh, sensor you're using, which is called a channel, it'll output a hybrid binary file. And each event is uh, ended with a number like the second event, the third event, the seventh event, here's the 16th event, et cetera. So you quickly get a huge amount of data files if you're doing a bunch of measurements using this kind of system. Cornucopia will very smartly read that in with a nice GUI reader that has the same kind of thing of clicking a check to have the commands be saved for you so then you can loop this. You can easily identify various data sets to read in. Cornucopia will handle all the naming and read it all in. And then once you have that data, you can go get at the data itself and have nice orderly data for you ready to manipulate and compute all with appropriate units and column names. Now you need to share data with other colleagues. We will of course show how to share plots um, since we demonstrate some plots, which will be occurring next. But when you just have data itself or variables, you wanna share with other uh, Cornucopia users, you can easily use the um, save and load functions of MATLAB to save variables. It'll save out K unit variables, just like any other variable, no problem. And then you can read those in. You can also of course write out stuff to text files with the K write text function. And that will smartly write it out with column names, units and whatnot. If you have non Cornucopia users you wanna share your data variables with, you can either convert them to a MATLAB table or struct with the two table and two struct methods or you can write the data out to a text file with the k write text, text function. All right, now the important thing, plotting data. Now that we've learned all about manipulating the variable and, and keeping it with units and whatnot, I wanna plot data. Cornucopia has a lot of capability to help you do this really efficiently. So the best practice is whenever you're making a plot, to issue a figure command or an axis or a subplot or something before the plot command itself to make sure that the plot goes where you expect. If you have some figure windows open and you issue a plot command, whatever was the hot figure or the hot axis, which was the last thing you had touched, that's the thing that the plot is gonna go into if you don't explicitly state either a parent command, which you're gonna learn about shortly, or you issue a figure command before the plotting. So. That's just a general suggestion. Um, Cornucopia has lots of capability pointed at XY plotting. Um, we don't use the MATLAB plot function. We use Cornucopia's K underscore plot function. 
That's because that function, the Canary Score plot function, will leverage all the meta information that's in your variables. Um, there's some other cornucopia functions you will typically use as well. Kfig zoom will allow you to easily change the figure size in, an, in a smart, natural way. And then the K display and figure is a function to allow you to easily put tables and other comments on your plots. And then there's a variety of other functions that Cornucopia has related to plotting and manipulating uh, plots, scaling it, and a bunch of other things. Um, so the K plot function itself, what it's designed to do is automatically handle all the issues related to units and labeling of the plot axes, the title, and the legend. You can easily plot one data curve or you can plot many data curves. And the way you plot many data curves from multiple variables is you put them into a cell array and just feed the cell array to the function. So if you're a MATLAB user and you're accustomed to doing for loops and hold on to make multiple curves, you want to forget about that syntax and you're gonna use the cell array approach. It's much faster, easier, and keeps your deck more elegant. You can also easily plot data sets in different compatible units. So you have data sets that come from a finite element model and one from a test. And let's say the acceleration is ones in Gs and ones in meters per second squared or whatever. No problem. You can feed all of that to the plotter and Cornucopia will handle that. Um, the basic rule will be the first thing that it's plotting, the first curve it's plotting, those will be the units that will dictate the plot. And all other stuff will be internally converted appropriately for the plot. You can also easily place well-formatted uh, tables uh, in your figure windows or on your plots with uh, the display on figure function, and I'll, we'll demonstrate that. Now, if you're doing other kinds of plots that are not 2D plots, like 3D plots or other kinds of things, um, those will not recognize the K-unit data type. So when you're doing that kind of thing, you're gonna do the A.data approach. A.data will get you the numeric data, and then you just feed that to the normal MATLAB plotting routines as you desire. Plotting has all kinds of capability in Cornucopia. Um, so again, in this Jumpstart course, I can't go over all of it. So there are a couple tutorials about doing tab figures and the plotting overview that will describe all kinds of scenarios of all the different flavors and features. I encourage you to look at those tutorials uh, when you have some time. Let's go through a typical example. So here I have some variable raw A. Raw A got created by me putting together five variables into a cell array. How do I do that kind of thing? I will quickly demonstrate that. So I think we still have our raw stuff here. So, oops. All right, so I have raw one, right? And I have these other raw variables. So if I wanted to put those into a cell array, I would simply make something like the, the variable I think was called raw A equals, and I would do something like this. So I would say I want raw one in there. Oops. And then I want raw two in there, and raw three in there. So now if I evaluate that, and I just echo here what's raw A, it's a cell array of three data sets. So you take whatever number of data sets you have and you stack them like this as a cell array. And go back to our PowerPoint. So in this example, I stack some five data sets together like that into a five by one cell array. Here I'm just echoing just one element out of the cell array showing you what we have for this particular example. So curly here means step into and I'm stepping into the first element of this cell array. So I'm just getting this output, which is being echoed. And here, um, the display brief was set to only four rows. So you only see a few rows of the data. And now I wanna plot all of these. So I'm gonna make a figure and I'm gonna feed the entire array to this. Now, this data set has three different columns. I can't plot on one XY plot, all three columns. I can only plot like one column versus another, like stress versus strain, stress versus time, strain versus time, something like that. So we want to reference the columns, but I'm feeding in a cell array. So I can't put 
a parenthesis right here and say, give me the second column or the third column or anything like that, because that would reference the Celerate level. I want it to reference the data set level. So what we use is an advanced option on the plot function called independent call and dependent call. And again, these could be typed short. So you could literally have typed independ and depend. And then we specify what we want. So here we're specifying it by name, nominal strain and nominal stress. I could also put in a number, two and three, to reference the second and third column for each data set. When we do this, hit F9, we get this. A beautiful plot, well labeled, even a legend automatically pops up because it took that from the description information that was from each data set and it automatically populated all that for you. Now we could have specified additional advanced options to control all of this, to control the names of the uh, labels, to control the uh, legend itself, to control where the legend is, even to control the units that are shown. We could have had it so that it's made the plot in units of KSI versus percent or whatever. So all of that's controllable by the advanced option calls of kplot. In Cornucopia, there is literally a very large amount of functions related to plotting. So that's a pretty large topic. Uh, we can't cover everything here. I will make a few highlighted comments. So um, the kplot function is the one I just demonstrated. Um, let's say you have a bunch of plots uh, in uh, either a single figure that it would subplot or maybe even on multiple tabs, and then you want them all to be to have the same limits. This function kplot match limits will allow you to do that very, very easily after all the plots are even made. So there's a lot of different capability here. These ones that are highlighted in the middle are related to making tabbed figures, which will be explained uh, in a moment. So the kplot function itself, so this one function here, it has 71 advanced options alone to do all kinds of stuff with plotting. So again, the tutorial and the examples will really highlight this. I will just be highlighting a few flavors of it in this course. Many of the functions and capabilities will be demonstrated in the examples that are being shown tomorrow. Here's kind of what you can do without a whole lot of complexity. So here I made a figure window. I'm using MATLAB's subplot function twice to make this plot axis and this one. I've controlled the size of the figure window with the kfig zoom function, which uh, I will show live uh, when we start doing some plotting and uh, most likely tomorrow. And then kplot was used twice, once for the top plot and once for the second plot. The second plot actually plotted multiple data sets, but that's just using the kplot once with data sets stacked. Uh, in this plot to control some of the things and the colors and a few other things, nine advanced options were used. And then to get this nice little summary table of key values put on the plot, this was not a PowerPoint trick. <laughs> this is the way it looks like in MATLAB. We use the display on fu figure function. And I used two additional advanced options on that to make the background yellow and to have it nicely boxed. So um, hopefully what you are seeing here is you can make really elegant plots that are very informative. Cornucopia has a ton of features to be able to do that. Now, once you've made a plot, you can right click on the plot in Cornucopia if you made it with Cornucopia's kplot function and you can do things that are really helpful. So right clicking on a plot allows you to pop out a copy of the plot, which is really helpful when you make multiple plots like doing subplot and they start to get kind of small or you have tabbed plots, which you'll learn about shortly and you wanna pull them out from two different tabs and then compare them next to each other. So you can do things like that. You can easily highlight curves and you can even right click and bring data back into the concession. I showed all of that uh, at the beginning of today when I showed the little video. You can also modify a few of the attributes like turning grids on and changing the scale and stuff like that. When you wanna do this kind of thing, right click to get the cornucopia tools, you need to make sure that you are not in zoom mode or pan mode. If you are right clicking, they won't show up. So you just need to click out of zoom or pan mode is what this little note is telling you. You can also get at the cornucopia menu. 
So whenever you make a bigger window with cornucopia and plots associated into it, an additional menu will show up here. It's the cornucopia menu. It has key things. So one is saving the figure uh, file itself. So MATLAB has this button here and under here is the saving option. In general with cornucopia, you do not want to use those to save the figure window. If you do, MATLAB will not properly pack up some of the cornucopia technology behind the scenes so that when you open it up later, some things might not work correctly. If you save it with the cornucopia window and use this thing here to save the figure window, it'll be all properly stored and saved so that not only cornucopia users can open it up later, but non-cornucopia users, just regular MATLAB users, will be able to open up and look at your plots. They won't have cornucopia features, but everything that's in the plot will be there for them to look at. Other things here are really nice, export figure to PDF. This will automatically, if you have multiple uh, tabs in your plot, will automatically walk through all of them and generate a really nice PDF result. Very, very helpful. We will demonstrate that in the workshops. And then you can attach with figure attached files. You can attach virtually anything you want to the figure window. It won't be visible per se, but you can attach the script, spreadsheets, PowerPoints, videos, whatever, you can attach them all. And then when you save this figure window with this command approach here, you can open it up later and get it. You can extract them back out, all kinds of stuff. So it becomes almost like a little virtual database. So let's say I wanna share plots with a colleague. I would open up the cornucopia menu and then I would um, make sure that I am saving it if I wanna um, have them open it up or I would be using the PDF, but we do not wanna use the MATLAB. These two, if you use these, um, there's the potential that all the cornucopia stuff behind there won't be properly saved. And as I stated a minute ago, it's really easy to create a PDF. So we're ready for the last section before we get to the workshops. So with the last 10 minutes, I'll go over this as only a couple of slides and then we'll end for today and we'll start tomorrow with the workshop. So we'll spend all day tomorrow going through the workshops, um, typing stuff in, exploring, trying different things out, getting a flavor for how to do real problems. Tabbed workbooks. So these are called uh, cornucopia result workbooks. So basically tabbed plots or tabbed figures. Here's a really intense figure. There's three levels of tabs and each one of these levels themselves might have some other set of levels. And so in this particular analysis, we're doing five stages of an analysis. So for each data type, we're looking at the raw data, discrete Fourier series, filtered version, computing a velocity by integrating accelerometer data and computing a shock response. Every one of those has multiple test events. So this test was run four different times, event number 33, 40, 42, and 44, plus some all-in-one analysis. The third row is representing the different types of data that were measured in each event, accelerometer data, strain gauge data, and laser displacement data. This particular example here, if I was to do this in the traditional MATLAB way, I would have 100 figure windows on the screen. That is totally unmanage not manageable, not even close. And if I were to make subplots, you can't put 100 subplots in a figure. <laughs> that becomes also not only unmanageable, it's unviewable. There'd be tiny little dots. But by doing these tabs, you can easily have all this data in a very organized, orderly manner. So you can save it as one figure window. You can export it as a single PDF and it'll automatically, Cornucopia will automatically go through all the tabs that give you this lovely PDF. And it basically serves as like a database. I can open it up later. I can right click anything with the Cornucopia tools. I can get data back out. I could save and attach my M file and anything else I want to this and store it all as one. So what do you get in a normal workflow? You would have a workflow that typically would be something of this flavor. You would have some picture or sketch of the problem involved. You might have some table showing some of the data sets that are gonna be processed in the workflow. 
then you would maybe have a tab where you have some commentary. Maybe you even mix the commentary with the picture on, on the same uh, tab. And then you might have other tabs that start to have multiple layers with all your results and then end with some other tabs of summaries or whatnot. These are the kind of cornucopia functions that would be used to make the various components. And then all the tabs themselves are created with the cornucopia k underscore fig tabs function library. So cornucopia has a bunch of these functions. They all start with the same root, k fig tabs. Then there's functions to create, clear, delete, display, and whatnot. To make this work and keep the figure window snappy when you put in a lar large number of figures, or large number of plots on the figure that all generally would have large amounts of data. If you just did this with normal MATLAB default technology, the figure window would come to a screeching halt. Chronocopia has a very smart tab management technology that uses the orphan technique. And what that ends up is that the figure windows stay nice and snappy and work very efficiently. You have a very large amount of flexibility in how you configure and use these. And many of the cornucopia examples go through this approach and use it to demonstrate creating output data. One of the things that will be common in all of this is you'll be commonly using the keyword or ADV param name called parent. Because when you issue plots or other commands like that, you'll need to tell MATLAB, where do you want the plot to go? In what tab or in what subregion of a tab or whatever? And so this will be something you'll start to use a traditional MATLAB uh, approach that you would have learned in college, you probably never would have used the word parent, the keyword parent. It wouldn't have been uh, introduced to you. When you do this kind of thing, this is the basic template of how these uh, tab plots are created. So you would have in a normal script up at the top, your normal stuff. And then you would typically put up at the top, you would generate a single figure window. You might give it some appropriate name. You might give it a position command so that the figure windows of a certain size on your screen. The fig zoom function is really helpful for that. And you would set this equal to a variable. There's nothing special about the name. It could be Bob. We generally would use something like fig H indicating that it's a figure handle. A figure handle is a pointer to the figure object. And what this allows us to do is we can then reference things to the figure handle. So the next thing we're gonna do is we're going to create in this example, 10 tabs into our figure window. And when we do that, um, we will now have a bunch of tabs that we can then start to fill in. And the basic approach we use is we reference what tab we want to make as the current tab. We empty it, clear it in case we're rerunning this a couple times. We give the tab maybe some intelligent name. You put in whatever plot command you want, and then you tell it to display that tab to you. And then you just issue this over and over as you go through your workflow. It's very easy to do. And you end up with a much more manageable workflow if you have lots of plots than you do if you have 10 or 20 or 50 plot figure windows all over your screen. This keeps everything packed nicely in a single figure entity. What I just described here is what's described here. And the key thing when you make a plot command or anything else like that, you would use this parent option to point at the current tab, which is where you want the plot to go. We are going to explore and learn this with the workshops that I will be doing tomorrow. Um, outside of that, this tutorial goes through this in significant detail and a large variety of the cornucopia examples, not all of them, but a large variety of them use this approach of the tab figure. We are going to start with these workshops tomorrow and the workshop examples, there'll be four of them. Uh, we will try to get through at least the first two. One is related to like dealing with accelerometer shock data kind of thing from FEA or experiments. And the other is cleaning up some measurement data that would come from an, like an Instron like thing. Uh, and the last two are comparing uh, FEA and physical test data for transient dynamic like problems. That concludes part five from our Cornucopia ML Quick Start training. Please continue with the next video, part six, via the link provided on our website.